welcome back to the Collective Drifts podcast. And I definitely want to welcome our new listeners as well. If you haven't already, definitely click that subscribe button right now. Well, this is an amazing episode where I interview the talented, intelligent Maria Elena Ortiz. And this was actually done prior to the coronavirus pandemic and the current racial discourse that is happening within America. But it's actually quite timely. In this episode, Maria Elena actually goes a lot into the Afro-Latina experience and Afro-Latina culture in the Caribbean, as well as her experience as an Afro-Latina living in Mexico. And we talk a bit about some of the racial and the class dynamics in Latin America versus America, versus the United States of America, that is. Listen up. This is a wonderful episode, as I said, and it is sponsored by the Knight Foundation on behalf of the Perez Art Museum Miami's Fund for African American Art. And there's some information on that in the description. So make sure you check that out. This is Collective Drift. I'm your host, Erica Verne Knowles. This platform was created to celebrate all women, the beauty of their cultures and international travel experiences. Welcome to Collective Drift. Um, she is a curator here at the Perez Art Museum, Miami, and she's originally from Puerto Rico. Yes, I am. Yes, she's originally from Puerto Rico. She is a black Latina, mm-hmm. and um, we're going to talk to her with her today about a number of things, um, but I want to get right into it. One, I want to thank you first, because you did participate as a co-host for The Art of Becoming a Woman, A Rum Punch Brunch, and that was absolutely amazing for oh. you to come through. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> thank <laughs> you for the invitation. Thank you. So how would you describe yourself? You know, it's funny. Well... First of all, thank you for also the invitation <laughs> to the podcast. I love podcasts. Um, a few, I would say six months ago, I asked some of my colleagues and friends to describe me in five words. Because mm-hmm. I thought it was like a cool exercise to think about. And I'm using, I'll use some of those words that came up to okay. describe myself. So they describe me as tropical, courageous, uh, funny, smart, how many words do I have there? I have... Um, Tropical, courageous, smart, funny, that's four. So I need one more. I guess intellectual. <laughs> okay. You definitely are intellectual, especially with the other side of now. And I took a look at a few of the interviews. It's like, oh, okay, wow, she's she's smart. Like, she knows her <laughs> stuff. Like, she's doing some real <sighs> research. You know, a lot of people, you do research when you're in college and, and you kind of, it stops there, but it seems like you're constantly learning. Well, yes. You know, I always say that I went into creating and just dealing with culture and arts because I felt like I needed to find my own context. Mm -hmm. So there's so very little histories of our realities, or at least I didn't see my reality growing up so Mm -hmm. much in the media in Puerto Rico. So it's it's been this learning process of who am I in this world. And that's that that pursuit is never ending. Right. So how, what have you found, how have you found yourself through your work? Uh, that's a tough question. You know, for example, when I started doing the research on the Caribbean, like you mm-hmm. said, I was born and raised in Puerto Rico, actually um, in San Juan, but raised in Carolina, which is the birthplace of reggaeton. Hey. <laughs> and, um, when I was there, I grew up in a very, you know, I was very fortunate and very grateful, mm-hmm. but also Puerto Rico has a very deep colonial history with Spain and now with the U.S. for over 100 years. And during the, that process of the most recent colonization, which is through the U.S., um, we're very isolated, mainly mm-hmm. because the U.S. negotiates all of our uh, agreements and all of our travel. I'm mm-hmm. a U.S. citizen and it's a U.S. port, so that means that to, for outsiders to travel mm-hmm. to Puerto Rico, you have to have a U.S. visa, which right. are very expensive. So all this to say that I grew up not knowing about the other parts of the Caribbean. Mm -hmm. Even though I knew through talking to my grandparents that our, even our own ethnicity wasn't um, so, it was very diverse. And what Mm -hmm. I mean by that is that my grandmother Mm -hmm. used to say that my great grandmother, my grandfather's mother was French. Okay. Which, she wasn't French, you know, she wasn't (laughs) from France. 
but that gave me the suspicion that she was from a French colony. Okay. That probably, you know, there were a lot of migration, especially after the Haitian Revolution, mm -hmm. within the island. So that, you know, there was more to me that wasn't as obvious. Okay. So when I won $10,000 to the Reachers throughout the Caribbean, my mm -hmm. first impulse was to go to the non-Spanish-speaking Caribbean. Okay. The islands that I did not know mo much about because it wasn't in my imaginary. It wasn't taught at school. Right. It wasn't talked about in an open way. So that's why I decided to go to Martinique, which is a French um, Caribbean island, and then Aruba, a Dutch Caribbean, Bahamas, mm -hmm. and Trinidad. Awesome. So that that way I've been kind of informing mm -hmm. my own context. Right. So what did um what did you like about those islands or what did you find um culturally in those islands that, you know, wowed you? Okay. Well, I'll start with Martinique. I really I mean Martinique is beautiful. Mm -hmm. I would recommend anybody to go. It has a lot of not only you know, it's very European, but also has connection to the fr the the, col the old colonies of Africa. So there's right. like a lot of Senegalese culture. Okay. And also, Martinique has this history of very similar to the American South. Mm -hmm. So where slavery was very institutionalized and 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 kind of very public facing. Right. So they have this families called the Beke, which mm -hmm. are like they're actually people that after the French Revolution moved to Martinique. Okay. And they, you know, they're lighter skinned individuals that kind of hold a lot of power within the island. Mm -hmm. And so it's n interesting to see those structures. Mm -hmm. And that was actually the first time I was talking to a photographer in mm -hmm. Martinique, a white, uh, a white Martinique, mm -hmm. and that he mentioned how he was taught to hate, how wow. his mother, it, and it was the first time that I kind of realized how racism, mm -hmm works both ways, not mm -hmm. only, you know, the people that are being oppressed, but mm -hmm. also the people that are being taught to hate. And that's mm -hmm. a very, actually a very violent act. Mm -hmm. And how that perspective is very um, important. So he was saying how he was, like, in the car, her mom would tell him to not look at the black people on the street. Oh, wow. And how hurtful, like, how violent that mm -hmm. experience was for him. Also, there is, you know, Napoleon's wife, she was from the island. She was from Martinique. She was mm -hmm. actually a Creole woman. Really? Okay. Josephine. Mm -hmm. So there's this, in the, the main square uh -huh. over there in Martinique, there was a, a statue to Josephine mm -hmm. that someone, let's say 10, 15 years ago, was beheaded and then put in like some blood drops. Oh my and gosh. And to me, it was like one of the most interesting like public art right. type, of, type of actions that are quite... Um, important or strong mm -hmm. because she's kind of, you know, they beheaded, beheaded this woman, this woman it's quite symbolic and who, exactly. So that was really cool and visual. Ex yeah. And then there's this beautiful plantation, um, actually old rum facility mm -hmm. called Fundacion Clement, which is amazing. I would mm -hmm. totally recommend you <laughs> to go there because they still distill rum and rum from Martinique is different from Puerto Rico. Okay and other parts of the Spanish Caribbean because it's very uh, perfumey and mm -hmm. you're supposed to drink it with sugar and lime, so you just right. drink it straight. So there you can get rum, but then you can also see great art because they have a great collection and great exhibitions. Mm -hmm. So it's a really nice um, uh, experience. And then, you know, other stuff that I'm now very much researching, which has to do with our histories of mm -hmm. the Caribbean and how Martini became a focal point for a lot of surrealists that came through through Europe during the war escaping. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, there's figures from Martinez, like Lisande or Aimé Cesar, right. specifically Aimé Cesar, who was, uh, was, went to study in Paris when mm -hmm. he was in, in, the, in the 40s, and then he met Fanon and others and subscribed himself to the Surrealist movement and then came back. So a lot, a lot of stuff to say about Martinez. Wow. Aruba, I thought that Aruba is really interesting mm -hmm. because it's very, it's not what you think. It's actually a desert. So it's not... It's similar to Miami, in which mm -hmm. Miami is subtropical and they manicure it for tourists to think right. that it's tropical. So similar to Turks and Caicos. And yeah. And so I was very surprised by going to Turks and Caicos. I'm like, wait a second. There is there's no grass, really. <laughs> it's just a bunch of rock. Yeah, it's very it's very desertic and it's very windy. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, it's very windy. So and there's a lot of sand and dirt, so mm -hmm. you can get, you know, uh, you just cover your eyes and touch them a lot because you, you don't realize how much we touch our face mm -hmm. in our environments. So right, and I have my hands on my face right now. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and 
and also you know Martinique um Aruba was a, a Dutch settlement right so I remember when I went there I started making some contacts with the art world and when I did the Skype I was I guess what who I was expecting to be on the other side of mm-hmm. the camera wasn't who I got so I okay. expected you know another dark skinned person mm-hmm. that was gonna talk to me about this and that but it was actually this really tall man mm-hmm. with Dutch features, very much, you know, burned by the sun. But this to say that because it was deserted, there was no plantation culture there. Okay. So you couldn't grow it. And so there's a different type of of settlements that happen in that island that are also quite um, interesting. And then, of course, the language is, to me, like they speak Papiamento, Mm -hmm. which is this combination of indigenous, Dutch, Spanish, English, and I don't know which other languages. And almost everybody there speaks at least four languages, which to me, you know, from in the U.S., which is mostly English, and in Miami, English and Spanish, Mm -hmm. to see that type of fluidity with language Mm -hmm. was impressive and completely blew my mind. So without the plantation culture there, did the the culture of racism play out there? Did you? Not really. No, it's... So the Dutch in the Caribbean, they were like the... um, the distributors of mm-hmm. slaves. So, and they had a few islands. They had Bonaire, Aruba, Curacao, and another one that I'm forgetting now. It was four. Mm-hmm. And then Curacao was like the slave portal. Mm-hmm. And from there, they would distribute the, the, the goods, the right. people, the enslaved mm-hmm. people. So they didn't have plantations there. Okay. Therefore, you don't have this culture of, you know... Um, racism and segregation. Exactly. And, and I think that when we talk about racism... Oppression. Like, exactly. And I think that when we talk about that, like I think that the, the U.S. is a very special context mm-hmm. because here... Racism, like racism, slavery was institutionalized. Absolutely. And it was something that, you know, like the whole thing with the bathrooms, the mm-hmm. places, the, you know, Absolutely. not mixing. Yeah, like living in, I had a chance, I lived in Peru for a while. I spent a, quite a few um, amount of time there and seeing the, the difference, there's definitely a, a difference in racism. Um, I think segregation plays a, a large part yes. of that. Um, in good ways and bad. I feel like segregation definitely led to, you know, the Malcolm X's and the Martin Luther King's, so we're now in a different place. Um, When I was in Peru, um, the the movie The Help came out while I was there, and it felt like their classism is still where the help is. Yes, yeah, yeah, and that's the thing, (laughs) that in especially Latin America and also Europe, classism Mm -hmm. economic is really what's determining um, power and... Let's not forget that the race discourse in this country hides the classism. Absolutely. So, like, and that's the part that it's a little bit... So it's a flip-flop. Like, here it hides the classism, there it hides the racism. It, yeah, yeah, yeah. But it's, but it's still different. It's still different, I would say, because it's not as aggressive as it you is know, in the I United mean, States. To your point, and actually where I should have gone with it, is I, what, I, what I did notice, in Peru specifically, I should say, um is that there is an embracement, like everyone embraces Afro-Peruvian culture. Yeah. And one of my friends there, she's Italian heritage, and she grew up taking Afro-Peruvian dance class, and that wasn't something that was unique. Yes, and that's to me like the big, one of the big differences mm-hmm. that stands Like here you're never going to have a white girl in your African dance class. Yes, never. Never. <laughs> and if she does, she'll be accused of cultural appropriation. She, exactly. Or, you know, because there's a history of... Um, kind of using people mm-hmm. and enslaving people. so. But there's still blackface in Peru. Yeah, <laughs> but even that, it's kind it's of, different. and now, yeah, and it's interesting because now I'm working on an exhibition which is looks more into how a lot of artists in Latin America use, like, indigenous motifs. Mm-hmm. And I was talking to some, I was just, I just came back from Mexico City. I went to the art fair, awesome. Maco, and Material, and so on. And I was talking to some of my uh, colleagues there and some of the artists there as well about this. Because I think that here in the United States, if a white artist was using African-American motifs to do something, it would be, like, you know, you took a it. big no-no. Right, like, yeah. no. And there, you know, because I didn't want to put my lens of, since I live in the U.S., mm-hmm. I didn't want to put my lens into that, so I started kind of learning, you know, asking, like, how do you guys treat that? Like, because mm-hmm. the art, for example, to say this artist or the other, they're not, like, obviously indigenous, but mm-hmm. how do you 
And they're like, well, we have a different experience of culture. Absolutely. You know, for us, we're mestizos, and it's not, and you know, and it's true. Like, if you if you go into Mexico, you know, since Diego Rivera, there's been an embracing of mm-hmm. indigenous practices. Frida Kahlo, you know, she mm-hmm. used to dress in a particular way. So there's a there's a conception of cultural um, hybridity, you know, in, in mm-hmm. the mestizo um, persona that is very different than, than the U.S. Absolutely. And it's very different in places like Aruba, and, and Curacao, and similar to Trinidad. Trinidad mm-hmm. was another, in the, the experience of race, because they never had slavery either. They, and they actually have natural resources, mm-hmm. so they were never a colony, and they actually had gas and oil. So they had the funds right. to do whatever to they wanted. Right, flourish the way that they are. Exactly, um, uh, which is, was very different from my context mm-hmm. of living in Puerto Rico that is still a colony, right. you know? Absolutely. So, so that was so also good. quite... Interesting that you... Um, you switch back to Puerto Rico because I wanted to ask you about that. In Puerto Rico, talk to me about um, Puerto Rican culture and what that means to you to be a Puerto Rican woman. You know, <laughs> I th- I mean, I'm Puerto Rican. <laughs> and I love being Puerto Rican, I'll say. I'm a black Puerto Rican. Puerto Rican culture, to me, is amazing. <laughs> um, it's, it's a very personal question. It chuckles question. you. Yeah, <laughs> it does. Especially probably because I'm now in the diaspora, mm-hmm. so like I'm not there, and there's been so many things happening in Puerto Rico in the last, you know, 25 years. Absolutely. Um, you know, not only from the hurricanes and the, the earthquakes, but also mm-hmm. the whole um, economic debacle that started mm-hmm. decades ago. It's funny. There's a Calle 13 song, mm-hmm. which is called one of his most the first singles that he had that was very. Um, famous that to me it describes Puerto Rican women very well mm-hmm. and it's called Atrevete and it says you know remember you're like a you're a street fighter you're from the streets and, <laughs> and I say that because I do think that Puerto Rican women we're very strong and we're very you know we, we have a we know how to maneuver ourselves and right. how to and we've been raised to you know stand up to ourselves right. and to still be mm-hmm you know, good cooks and good dancers and whatever. So there's a, a little bit of truth to the stereotype of the fiery Puerto Rican. Yeah, but I, you know, I'm not... Depends how you define fiery. Like, mm-hmm. what I what I think about, I think that I stand up for myself. And if right. that is a negative thing, that, you know, I don't... That, that's that's, a, that's, that's just, your problem. That's your problem, <laughs> and that's a stereotype that's been put up that that's not fair. I think that every woman, especially in today's world, mm-hmm. we need to stand up for ourselves. So I think that I just want to highlight that sometimes when a woman stands up for themselves, they're fiery. Mm-hmm. You know, when a man does, and they're just being a man. Right. So like, I would say more like we. I was raised. My sisters were raised. Mm-hmm. My other female friends were raised to stand up for uh, ourselves, mm-hmm. to have strong beliefs, to own th- those beliefs. And that's a big difference I see with like sometimes that purely American culture that is, you know, it's very much very money oriented. Mm-hmm. In my culture, very oriented into like having strong beliefs about family, mm-hmm. about ways of life, and to honor those. And family mm-hmm. is another big one. I think that in terms of Puerto Rican culture, like I grew up in this idea that family was like the most important thing, mm-hmm. and that your other Puerto Ricans are part of your family. Okay. Um, and that you, sh- which is I guess is similar to African American community where mm-hmm. there's a lot of strength on like you know the group and the right. community. And I just recently saw a post, like, everything is about posts now, about cousins. And yes, <laughs> yes, totally. And it was like, there's, when black people say cousins, they mean one thing, and when white people say cousins, or, or they might not even use cousins in the same definitely, step away. Definitely, <laughs> definitely, yeah. Like, I have third cousins that I call cousins, and now that I'm a mother, I think a lot about my son and having grown up with his cousins, mm-hmm. you know? Right. Um, uh, and same with aunts, great right. aunts. And all that, um, and sisters that you that are not really your, your sister. biologically your mm-hmm. sisters, but they're but your the aunts sister. galore. There's like aunts yes. everywhere. Right? <laughs> exactly, exactly. Um, and then there's other more in terms of to finish up Puerto Rican culture. There's other things that are more um, obvious Puerto Rican to me, which is of course food, mm-hmm. and language, and music. To me, those are kind of three tenets that are very much um, um, very Puerto Rican. Mm-hmm. I think there's other stuff, especially as a woman of color, mm-hmm. that are like mixing. I think that to, that that's been very um, 
how would you say it? Like that's a big different that I see with the U.S. Mm-hmm. Sometimes, like I, it's I think now it's not as different as it was before. How so? Like, um, for example, I have uh, my my aunt and my and my my aunt and my uncle. Mm-hmm. My uncle is black. My aunt is white. They have three children. One that's white. Two that are black. Mm-hmm. You know, and that's normal. Right. In Puerto Rico, and you see that a lot here. Mm-hmm. Especially once you go keep going, I think Miami is different. But once you start leaving Orlando, those types <laughs> of, of of images I don't see as often, mm-hmm. or and are not as acceptable. Exactly, <laughs> exactly, and are not acceptable. Yeah. Okay, I wanted to ask you. Um, speaking of Puerto Rican culture and your family. And um, you mentioned your grandmother and great grandmother. Um, what did you learn um, from the women that you know about being a woman and, and growing up in, in your culture and, and directly from your family? Yes, um, I grew up in a family of women. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, I have three sisters, actually four sisters, and then we were in Puerto Rican culture. You kind of go to your mother's side. I don't mm-hmm. know how it's here, but mm-hmm. once the parents get married, the mother's side becomes like that. The family. Exactly. My mother, you know, she's a pediatric radiologist, so she's a very specialized doctor. Mm-hmm. She has four kids. She's a pediatric radiologist? Yes. Okay. So she's a radiologist for little kids, for mm-hmm. kids. And so she's a very specialized doctor, and she was also, she also has four children. Mm-hmm. And, you know, Growing up with that model of like this really strong kind of black woman Mm -hmm. that is the breadwinner of the family that just works all the time and is intelligent, highly intelligent, intelligent. (laughs) that was very impactful for the way that I kind of learned and matter work through the world. Mm -hmm. She was also very modest, I was very modest, Mm -hmm. and she's not very, um. And I don't know if this is just the way that she grew up because she told me once she has a, a friend and there was another there was an only another black person in her medical class which is another woman mm-hmm. so I can also not imagine growing up being just very smart and then only one of two black people mm-hmm. in your medical class right so I don't know if because of that you she learned to as a as a way of survival to not be as ostentatious with her mm-hmm. not with her skill set. But others saw that. So, uh, you know, she graduated when she was 17 from high school. Mm-hmm. So she graduated early. And then another female doctor, a white Puerto Rican doctor, saw her skills. It kind of took her under her wing and was like, right. come and work with me. But she, was, so, but she was never, you know, I have a strong kind of outward face and personality. That's mm-hmm. not my mom. She's okay. very kind of like a nerd type of thing. Mm-hmm. And because of that, she raised us to be very outspoken. Okay. Because she wanted us to... So she's an introvert that wanted you to be an extrovert. Exactly. (laughs) That wanted us to be... And all my sisters were very kind of extroverted girls, very Mm -hmm. strong. And and that was important for her. And it was also important for her to... You know, she wanted us to have a family, but she didn't want us to rush into having a family. Mm -hmm. Because in her generation, that's what women did. Like, she got married at 23... And then had her first child because that was the only way she could get out of the house to wow. have to be married, and and she's like in medical school and she's in medical school <laughs> exactly, so she very much you know wanted us to have a life and eventually have children right. and have a family and whatnot. But that was also something that she never pushed on us. How many siblings do you have? So there's five of us, but my dad he was married twice. So he had us mm-hmm. uh, my older sister. And then he married my mom, mm-hmm. and uh, and my mom also married. You know, she they both grew up in a very religious mm-hmm. space, like Baptist. Mm-hmm. A lot of you know the Baptist church did a lot of converting in Puerto Rico. Okay, <laughs> and he they converted part of like a lot a big section in Carolina, which. Well, I didn't realize that. I would just assume like Catholicism. <laughs> no, so my and I think, you know, there's another research to be done, mm-hmm. but. I wouldn't be surprised that the conversion also had to do with race. Mm-hmm. And I say that because the area that my family is from is an area that had been, they had a lot of free color people. Mm-hmm. 
So, and then when the U.S. comes in in 19, in 1898, you know, they come in with a full-blown slavery, race segregation right. <laughs> industry. Like, hey, welcome. <laughs> exactly. So I would, and so there was like a lot of, and there were wealthy black people in Puerto Rico. Mm -hmm. um, so I wouldn't be surprised if like the reason why those, the Protestant religion, which at times, I mean, I don't know. I'm, I'm here now right. drafting thoughts. That being said, um, she raises a very extrovert and to really try to have a life and, and be dynamic women. Both, both my mom and my dad. Mm -hmm. My dad was really against quinceañeras. He said that mm -hmm. they were one of, they were like selling your daughters into into marriage, wow. and he never he would never. I, I didn't have a quinceañera. Like he would never wow. promote that. So how did that feel to you? It was fine. We just did a Disney trip, you know. <laughs> It was fine, and I just went to other quinceañeras. Like it, it, it didn't. It never because I wasn't raised like that. I was right. from a very early, early age. Like even though it's a part of the culture, yeah. it wasn't a part of your household, and exactly. this is also a part of your beliefs. Exactly, I wasn't taught to to like quinceañeras. <laughs> I was taught that they're actually that was right. not the political side. They they're just for showing off women mm -hmm. and to try to find them husbands and um, yeah, wow. yeah. So, so and my grandmother was also a big, as well as my aunt, my aunt's another professional, but um, my grandmother was also a very important figure in my um, childhood and my mm -hmm. adulthood. Um, she recently passed away last year in 2018. Mm, I hear that. And she was very important because she was, you know, while my mom was working and doing mm -hmm. this and that, she was like taking care of us. So right. she was like the motherly, the more motherly kind of caring figure. Mm -hmm. And... And and but she was also, you know, she was a Leo, so she was very, um, you know, she had her opinions. Exactly. That she Fiery. Shared. <laughs> yes, or you know, yeah, uh, not in front of my grandfather, but but yeah. <laughs> got you, got you. Okay, so now you're in Miami. Um, when did you come here? I came here in 2013. Okay. And I was working in Mexico City. Mm -hmm. You know, I graduated in 20. Ten from graduate school, mm -hmm. and I didn't really know, you know, as a black Latina, I really did not know what I was getting myself into in museums and right. how, you know, you see class in museums, you see race in museums, Absolutely. and I didn't know about that, and especially because I grew up in Puerto Rico, right. and, and you just, you know, I didn't know. Which, this kind of reminds me of, um, so when you were at Collective, uh, the um, Art of Becoming a Woman, yes. you hosted the conversation on what is it like to be the only woman. Yeah. This is what I was thinking about when you were talking about your travels through the Caribbean, because yeah. you mentioned two white men that yeah. you came across. And through your travels, I imagine you've had this experience of being the only woman, yeah. especially um, in the art world. So yeah. can you, what was that like? Or what is that like? Because you're in that now. Yes. Um, I think that's okay. I I think that. I'm thinking. Or how you do you know, navigate that? So I'll say this. So growing up, I was you know I have four siblings that I grew up with, mm -hmm. and my sisters they all went into medicine, and I was like the weird artsy kid mm -hmm. that ended up in a different route. My brother is also is a musician, but he, and he also ended up in a different way. But 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 within the women, I was the different one. So I kind of I, I learned how to have a different point of view, mm -hmm. and that was encouraged in my household. I think that what I did not expect, and mm -hmm. also this idea of being the only one, which was part of the collective drift, it's it's more about women in the work fear field and in the workforce. Mm -hmm. I, I think there's a lot of more to do in that respect. And sometimes you find yourself being the only woman in a table full of men. That's mm -hmm. very common. And um, and how to navigate that, that's not something that, which is why I said I accepted to go to, to your events because it was for women. So mm -hmm. I think that the more that we as women can talk about those experience and share and realize, right. oh wait, this is, because at, at my table there was another woman who she she totally knew what I, you know and, and she would and, and she would share her strategy of constantly asserting herself mm -hmm. to to do that. I because I lived in different places, I mm -hmm. have to do different strategies to navigate that. Right, because you're dealing with different cultures and the way that they handle things. Exactly. Right. For example, when I lived in Mexico City, 
there, which is for the machismo, it's a little bit more. I don't know because there's the mach- there's machismo in the United States as well, right. the men culture, but it's just not so called it's, machismo. It's not, you're right. Exactly. So where the male culture is a little bit different. I remember my old boss, which was a Cuban woman. She used to tell me, okay, we're gonna go ask for money to, because the government, the museums in Mexico are owned by the, mm-hmm. by the government, mm-hmm. so you have to go to the government office to ask for funds. So she would tell me, we're gonna go to the government office. Remember, wear a nice dress, wear heels, put on makeup, smile. Mm-hmm. You know, like there, like this, this feminine, our feminine attributes, what would get us to the next step? Right, it gets and, you in the door. And here, that sounds awful, mm-hmm. but to a certain extent, I appreciated that transparency mm-hmm. that that you had that you had there. I knew, okay, and, and you know, I remember dealing with you know sometimes negotiating with men that I could I had to get another guy to negotiate on my behalf. Jeesh. So stuff like that um, that I would have to do there mm-hmm. that I don't do here. What was it like living in Mexico City? Oh, I loved it. <laughs> I know that sounds like a little bit um, different than than the U.S., but Mexico is great. First of all, it's very cheap, mm-hmm. and it can be expensive, but the big difference is that they don't have the consumer culture that you have here. They okay. have to buy, 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 or have the newest car or whatever. They're very resourceful. Mm-hmm. Full. And the art scene is also really cool okay. because it's you can live – you can live as an artist, and mm-hmm. the government, at least then, was giving a lot of support for artists. So, for example, they had um, some phone ca- uh, grants where you can have like I don't know, I don't remember, it was like eight thousand dollars, which is actually a lot for Mexico because right. my salary was like a thousand dollars, and it was a good salary, eight thousand mm-hmm. dollars, a thousand dollars a month. And their artists, some of them, would get like from eight to ten thousand dollars a year. For like two to three years, just to be an artist. Wow! You and know? if your salary is exactly yeah, that's pretty exactly. similar. Right? Exactly. You can you can get out an apartment, or you can get a roommate, and you can live as an artist. So so there's a lot of support for for mm-hmm. artists and for art, mm-hmm. and that creates for a very you know mm-hmm. dynamic art scene where the artist is not can have space to create, mm-hmm. and for a curator. You know, we had artists that were just doing stuff on the streets or right. or doing exhibitions anywhere because of this kind of support. That was, um, I've never, you know, thought of it that way. Um, but it just, you know, if you have artists that are now funded and able to recreate, now you have access to more artwork, which leads to you having access to more, like, higher quality artwork because artists are making more work. Definitely, well, definitely. And also... It also, um, how would I say this? I think that there's something very, for for the quality of art, Mm -hmm. there's something very enriching that can happen when an artist is not solely focused on selling an artwork. Mm -hmm. Um, Then they can experiment, which is, I think it's good for the art practice. Um, of course, artists have to eat, and they should be wanting to sell and to get a nice gallery and all that right. good stuff. But at least for creation mm-hmm. and for artistic exploration, exploration. I mean, you, you never know what's going to come out of that. Like yes. there might be you're, you're experimenting, you're experimenting, and then something is yes. going to come up that's going to be new. And, and also, if you have if you have a supported artistic community, then you have galleries that can you know, do their businesses. Then mm-hmm. you have museums that can, you know, do another part within the ecosystem. So it's just it's just like a, an investment right. within the art ecosystem that I think pays a long way. Okay. And, it, and it's just, it's, it's also when you think about it, you know, there's 20 million people in Mexico City. Let's say there's, I don't know, uh, a million artists. It's just something like this is for like 10 people. You know, it's mm-hmm. not like you're investing like millions of dollars on this. It's just a little bit goes a long way. So what, um, if someone were going to Mexico City, what would you recommend them to do? Okay, so I would recommend them to start making restaurant reservations. <laughs> so you need to go to Contramar. If you like seafood, the tostadas de atún, they're just delicious. You have to go to Pujol, which is also delicious. And that restaurant is booked like three months in advance. Oh, wow. Three yeah. months in advance? Yeah. Like, I, I was lucky enough when I just went that I was able to. An artist invited me to his... Um, events there Mm -hmm. but when I started booking I was like oh my god it's nothing is available Uh, (laughs) I felt so silly 
and I would also, you know, there's a lot of restaurants to go to, right. but I would definitely do my due diligence before going, mm -hmm. get on Yelp, mm -hmm. get on the internet, talk to friends, and make those reservations, or just know where you're going to eat right. before going. I think culture is all about food. Yes. <laughs> but, and also because, you know, you don't want to get Montezuma's revenge. Yes. And that, you the chances of you getting it are high. Okay. So don't drink the water. You can use it to wash your teeth, but just don't drink it. And also don't drink things that have water that you don't realize that could be mm -hmm. infected, such the as the juice. juice. Yeah. The juice from the street, the yeah. soup. You, salad. Salad. You can venture into eating tacos from the street because those are just, you know, coked from, mm -hmm. from But water. with no lettuce in it. Yeah, they <laughs> don't put lettuce in it. <laughs> <laughs> it goes cilantro, but. So I would say that, and I would also say that, you know, there's a lot of museums in Mexico. There's some more museums in Mexico City than in New York. Wow. So if you're into going to a museum, go to the Anthropology Museum. That's mm -hmm. like a day or two of your trip. But it's totally worth it. I mean, it's amazing. You should also go to Frida Kahlo, the Blue House. Yes. <laughs> I really like that place in Coyoacan. Mm -hmm. And, um, I mean, there's a lot of art museums to go to. There's Humex, there's Moac, there's Samayo, there's Saps, where I used to work at. Mm -hmm. But I would pick and choose, you know, I would pick and choose with the museum, and I also pick and choose with the gallery. Mm -hmm. Galleries, I would totally go to Curiman Suto, Labor, Agustina Ferreira. So I would, you know, I would do my research and pick, because Mexico City is like going to New York, but mm -hmm. a little bit more intense. Wow. Because there's a lot to do, there's a lot of food, and mm -hmm. there's also traffic. Okay. <laughs> so, and if you can, I think the best way to do Mexico is to maybe do for two weeks, mm -hmm. do one week in Mexico City and another week outside of Mexico City. Okay. One of the best things about Mexico, the country, is that the provincia, as they call it, is like completely, it's, a, it's amazing. So mm -hmm. Tulum, Oaxaca, Puerto yeah. Escondido. Uh, Chiapas, just pick your town. Pick your town. I need to go back to Mexico because I've only I've been to Mexico twice, but mm -hmm. I've only done the the touristy like mm -hmm. Mexico. Like I went to Cancun. Okay, for my I've senior trip. Been to You've been to Cancun. You've been in Miami. It's yeah. Cancun. Okay. Okay. Yeah. See, <laughs> like I've spring never, break. <laughs> I've never done that. I've never done like that. Yeah. The, I done. I did Tulum, and Tulum is amazing. Yeah. I, I want to go to Tulum, and I went to Puerto Vallarta, which is yeah. beautiful, but yeah. again, like super. Yeah super t yeah. touristy. I went to a little island which was, you know, somewhat of a, a more yeah. authentic experience. But um, well, of and I, those, had a blast. I did a lot of zip lining and ATV rides. That was that was that was fun. That sounds good. <laughs> yeah. Well of those I would say if you're into art, maybe mm -hmm. I'll try to go to Guadalajara because mm -hmm. they have a nice contemporary art scene there. If you're into relaxation then Tulum, mm -hmm. Oaxaca, I would always Oaxaca to me has the best me food in Mexico. So what was your favorite experience in Mexico? Like, okay, this day, oh my gosh, this happened, and, like, unforgettable. There's so many. <laughs> well, perhaps, I would say two things. The first one is a trip that I did with my family. They came to visit, and we did we did Oaxaca, Puerto Escondido, another place that we just basically ate like kings. We, <laughs> it was like, I forgot the name. I think it was very close to Puerto Escondido, but basically, mm -hmm. you wait on the beach, like, mm -hmm. literally, it was, like, this beach that, like, there were a lot of food vendors mm -hmm. very close to it, and they just kept bringing us seafood. That was amazing and super cheap. And then I also enjoy, like, I had, I really, I developed a really great friendship there with another woman. Mm -hmm. um, she's also an artist. Her name is Mama Garcia. And we had a great time. Just She was also a foreigner. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I was there last week. And she, Where was she from? She was from Colombia, from mm -hmm. Medellin. And we used to just ride on our bikes and um, go to the, to the event. And recently she actually got a motorcycle, so we were just on her motorcycle. <laughs> like, um, it's a very freeing, it's a very freeing city, I would okay. say. What are the women like there? Most of my friends were foreigners. Okay. Um, and your boss was Cuban. And my boss was Cuban. Okay. Uh, but women in Mexico, they're strong. Mm -hmm. They're strong women. I mean, they're strong women. <laughs> <laughs> they're strong women. And they're very friendly and they're very smiley, but they're also very strong. strong. Okay. Yeah. Awesome. And, and very elegant, I would say. And then um, while we're abroad, <laughs> as we're on our airplane, so to say, mm -hmm. what um, has been your favorite? What is your other like favorite city that you've been to outside of Mexico, outside of the U.S., outside of Puerto Rico? Um, I mean, I really like Sao Paulo. 
Mm-hmm. Sao Paulo um, has a great art scene. Yes. Great sushi. And Melissa shoes. Yes. <laughs> great fashion. <laughs> and, and I mean, I guess I like food a lot, as you mm-hmm. can tell. Another place that I really like is Spain. Yes. The Believe food is amazing yeah. in Spain. This food, the wine. What's your favorite restaurant in Spain? Do I don't know. I, I know I went to we went to a place in Sevilla. It was pretty neat. Sevilla mm-hmm. had really good food. I haven't been to the north, to San Sebastián. I hear that that's where also where the, where the best food is. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I would say that. Awesome. So let's take it back to Miami. And you're, we're here. We're at the Perez Museum. This is you know where, where you're curating now. Um, and this is where you're living. So why have you chosen to live in Miami and... Um, I think Miami chose me, mm-hmm. <laughs> I would say that. Basically, I was in Mexico, I was having a good time there, mm-hmm. then my old boss um, kind of invited me to come and work here, and mm-hmm. I thought, like, why not? I'll be mm-hmm. close to Puerto Rico, which I love, and then I'm young, why not, you know, if I hate it, then I can just go back to or move on. Mm-hmm. But then I fell in love, and, you know, all that stuff happened. Mm-hmm. And so I that made my prompt me to stay longer, but at the same time, at Pam, I can work with the things that I very much is stimulated by, mm-hmm. like you know, Caribbean culture, identity, Black culture, mm-hmm. Latin American culture, all the things that we've been talking about. If you right. really think about it, are the things that I'm able to do here, that is very very filling. Mm-hmm. Absolutely, and we're yeah. getting ready to have the. Um, Art Plus Soul. Yes. And that's yes. going to be the best party. It is the best party. This will this will play after Art Plus Soul, but you yeah. can go to Art Plus Soul 2021 20, and you can contribute to the Fund for African American Art yes. now. Yes. As, um, Please contribute. And even if you don't come to, to this year, you can come next year and you can still contribute. And all the proceeds of that endowment, which mm-hmm. is now become an endowment, goes to collecting art for the museum. Absolutely. And that's amazing. And I'll say one thing mm-hmm. about Mexico City, now that mm-hmm. we talk about this topic, one big reason why I also said I should go to Miami is because in Mexico City, even though I liked it a lot, I didn't see a lot of people like me on the street. And that can be a little bit, you know, yeah, a little bit... I, it, it makes your personal life more difficult. Absolutely. I lived in Thailand. I didn't realize it that how much of a difference it made until I would say this year or no last year middle of last year like getting into a new relationship and just being like oh wait when I came back to Miami all these things happened started dating a lot da, da, yeah. da, da, and it was all super exciting yeah and it was I was like wait a second it was so exciting because I was in Thailand forever yes <laughs> and yes. no one saw me exactly exactly because I always say that there in a place like where you're the only you know, mm-hmm. black woman and so on. You're like a panther or like a tiger, like an exotic animal. Mm-hmm. And at first, you're like really interesting and really like, oh my God. But then they don't know what to do with you. And mm-hmm. it's good. And also, you don't know what to do with them because they're also kind of different. Mm-hmm. So, Miami is much more comfortable for you. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. So I mean, I learned how to relax. I, I, now I'm with my natural hair, but before I was mm-hmm. relaxing it, and I used to do it on my own, mm-hmm. and, which is something I just had to learn there. Mm-hmm. Because um, I wanted to have it straightened at that point in my life. Right. I was actually um, one of the other interviewees, um, Hopi. She was saying, you know, she's, I don't know if you know Hopi, she lives here in Miami. But she's um, mixed. Her mother's Caucasian, her father's African American. And she said she decided to live in Miami because, you know, she actually fits in here. Yeah. Because it's so diverse. There's so much of that mixing that she was yes. talking about earlier. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So, what are some of your favorite places and things to do in Miami? In Miami, I enjoy <laughs> I enjoy relaxing and breathing. <laughs> like I think we don't, especially because I was my uh, my previous city was so it was high up in altitude and so polluted. <laughs> it's easy to breathe here. It's easy to breathe here, and I really enjoy it. And I, I enjoy the outside. It's like I I've been really taking a lot of enjoyment into gardening. Mm-hmm. So so is that something that you do for self care and those? Yeah. I do that. I also meditate and mm-hmm. I do yoga and I get a massage every so often. Not mm-hmm. every month, but every when I feel like I need it. Mm-hmm. And I yeah, I do stuff like that. Like I like to pamper myself. Awesome. Yeah. And again, yoga and meditation have been amazing. Just to you know, 
making one Did, focus. Um, when you started, how long was it before you saw that shift? Everyone talks about this shift. I would say the first class. Wow. I would say the first class. With meditation, I would say maybe a month. Mm -hmm. But it's been it's been amazing what it has done to my mental health and my and just my my spirit. Mm -hmm. I mean, my husband, mm -hmm. even though I go like sometimes like six thirty and come back at eight, he's like, yeah, go. Like <laughs> he's like he, he supports it hundred mm -hmm. ten percent, and I think it's because he sees you know the difference in me because it's hard it's hard to be working mm -hmm. you know all the stuff that we carry mm -hmm. and and you know being a, a specific type of person mm -hmm. you know it's hard and absolutely um, now being a mother like it's it's to, to balance all those things and to manage that is difficult so you need a, a place to regroup and to and to kind of disconnect absolutely so you you found that and it and it works for you that's and, yeah. and your partner respects that that's oh yeah so beautiful totally if not we wouldn't be i mean i had a friend that once told me you have to be with a person that expands your universe you know mm -hmm. like they just they're you know they just help you be who you are right and because they help you be who you are you can then take who you are to the next level or to a more expansive way Absolutely. And, and also my grandmother used to say you have to be with the guy that loves you the most. Mm -hmm. <laughs> You'll eventually love them, you know, right. equally, but he, they should love you more. Exactly. They yeah. should be, I mean, if, I don't know, I feel like as a woman, we have so many things to negotiate. Um, and love shouldn't be one of those. Yes, exactly. I just, um, Eartha Kitt, I just posted this photo of her because um, Spelman College has all this work of photography from black um, artists and photographers and it, there's this interview um, that have, have you ever seen it where she says they ask her about well, about compromise and relationships and rips and she's like compromise <laughs> <laughs> what do you mean compromise like why am I compromising <laughs> yeah well sometimes I compromise but not with it but there's some things that I don't compromise right. with you know I mean maybe I compromise with let me think oh watching football you know, <laughs> right? <laughs> like you know, a Sunday or letting that happen. Right. Sure, but not the way you're gonna be loved. Exactly. So I have two wrap-up questions. Um, the first one is, if you could ask women in general a question, all women, what would that question be? That's hard. Um, how do you feel? How do you feel today? Okay, and. What does it mean to be a woman? To be powerful, to be powerful, and to own our power and use it accordingly. Okay. Yeah, we're very powerful. I mean, we give light. People don't don't <laughs> talk about that enough. But can you imagine a man like getting their period every month? You know what I mean? Like we, <laughs> right? We are very powerful. That's why they want us contained. Mm -hmm. Um. Yeah. Absolutely. So thank you so no, much. You. I really appreciate your time. And I guess everyone, you know, stay powerful. Well, women, yeah. Women, you stay powerful. <laughs> thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thanks so much for listening to this episode of Collective Drift with Maria Elena Ortiz. I just want to let you know that you can find Maria Elena on Instagram at Contemporary Chica. And definitely follow the Perez Art Museum Miami on Instagram as well. That's P-A-M-M -M on Instagram. And take a minute to go to pam.org forward slash art fund to learn more about the PAM Fund for African American Art. Of course, everyone, please go to the Collective Drift website, collectivedrift.com, and follow our social media accounts. So subscribe on youtube.com forward slash Collective Drift. Follow Collective Drift on Instagram and on Facebook. I hope to see you again soon. Have a great day. Stay safe. Wear your mask when you're in public. Bye.